Hi folks, this is Pastor Paul Frick. I'm speaking to you from my church office here at Liberty Baptist Church, looking at Red Sea rules. We're on rule number eight. Today we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 14, verses 21 through 29. So while you're opening up your Bible to that portion of scripture, I want to remind you about the first seven rules that we looked at. So number one, uh, realize that God means for you to be where you are. Rule number two, be more concerned for God's glory than for your relief. Rule three, acknowledge your enemy, but keep your eyes on the Lord. Rule number four, pray. Rule number five, stay calm and confident and give God time to work. Rule number six, when unsure, take the next step by faith as directed by God. Rule seven, envision God's enveloping presence. And then today, rule eight, trust God to deliver in his own unique way. Trust God to deliver in his own unique way. So we're... With the people of Israel, they got the army of Pharaoh behind them, and they have the Red Sea in front of them. So we're going to uh, actually see in this passage the dividing of the Red Sea. If you've ever seen the Charlton Heston movie, The Ten Commandments, uh, this is a great scene where um, he parts the waters, and the people uh, walk on dry land, and it's like they're in the Tennessee Aquarium. And there's these big, there's a big wall of uh, water here, and big wall of water there. Very, very neat passage, and it's neat how, uh, with that movie being sixty plus years old, how they um, were able to use the graphics available and the special effects available to them then in order to make that happen. Okay, enough of that. Exodus chapter 14, starting verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry land, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. So I really, um, I really like it that even uh, though they did not really believe in the Lord, they understood that the Lord fights for them. Okay. Then the Lord said to Moses, "Stretch out your hand over the sea, and th that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen." And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the army of Pharaoh. They came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained, but the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. So uh, we we see this miracle of the sea being parted. And then also I think that in this miracle was the recognition uh, by the Egyptians that God was fighting for them. And to me, that's one of the great lessons that we get uh, from this particular passage is that when we leave things in God's hands, when we trust him and trust in his ways, other people 
we'll see that God is working. Hopefully we see it, but they'll see it also. And that is a great witness. I mean, that's, see, that's the reason that God does miracles. Yes, it is to deliver us and give us victory in times of struggles, but also it is so that his name will be glorified. It's so that his witness to the world will be that he takes care of his children and that his power is real in this world. So um, uh, the, the miracles are to be a witness to others. And, uh, you know, I, I think that for the Israelites, they, they truly saw the power of the Lord and they feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. There are some other times that, uh, that God gave his miracles. And one of those that I want to talk about is in Joshua chapter 4, verses 18 through 24. So we're going to fast forward to the time in which uh, Joshua now is in charge. Moses has died. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the, uh, the crossing of the people of Israel uh, from the uh, desert into uh, the promised land. And God parted the, the Jordan Sea, just, like, just as he parted the Red, the, the Red Sea for them to, um, to get into the desert. From the desert to the promised land, he parted the Jordan River. All righty. Joshua chapter 4, starting verse 18. And it came to pass when the priest who bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord had come from the midst of the Jordan and the soles of the priest's feet touched the dry land that the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all its banks as before. Because when their feet touched the water, it parted. Now it's come back together. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those 12 stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in, in Gilgal. So what he did was they had, they had each uh, tribe, of the, there were 12 tribes, they all brought a big stone out of the midst of the riverbed, of the river Jordan, and they were setting up this pillar as a witness. Okay. Then he spoke, verse 21, to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask their fathers in times in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So here again, there's a miracle here. Two reasons that all the peoples of the earth will know the hand of the Lord and that the people of Israel may fear the Lord forever. Well, they didn't fear very long. It's part of the problem. They uh, they conquered Jericho. And they marched around it seven days, and then on that seventh day, they marched around it seven times. The walls fell, and they took over this great fortified city. So then they're getting ready to go to Ai, and uh, you literally spell it Ai. So um, it's in uh, chapter... 7, verses 1 through 13 of Joshua. And they, they spy out uh, the city and they're thinking, Jericho is this great big city. It took all of us. AI is a small city. We'll just do, you know, so, we'll just use some of the troops, okay? And um, I'll be reading about this. But um, they started trusting in themselves rather than God. Whenever we are confronted with a situation in life, 
we may have the understanding and the ability to deal with that problem or that circumstance. But as Christians, we ought always to pray because God may want us to do something a different way. Okay? So Joshua chapter 7. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things for Achan, the son of, of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, and the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things so that the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. So what happened was Achan, uh, when, when they were uh, defeating Jericho, they were supposed to destroy everything. But he took some of the stuff for himself, which was a, that was a common practice um, of warfare and kind of is even today that uh, if you're a soldier or you're a part of a conquering force, whatever you find uh, is kind of a um, the spoils of war. But whenever the people of Israel were fighting uh, for the Lord and conquering land in the name of God, uh, God would tell them what they could take and what they couldn't take. And sometimes there were there were precious metals and jewels that were supposed to be brought into the treasury of the Lord. And every, every battle, they were supposed to consult God and to find out, you know, how exactly we're we supposed to handle um, uh, the, the people, the livestock, uh, the possessions these people had. So um, they were some, they were the accursed things. Achan went ahead and took it anyway. All right. So uh, starting verse two. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is be, which is beside Beth Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spoke to them, saying, "Go up and spy out the country." So the men went up and spied out Ai, and they returned to Joshua and said to him, "Do not let all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up, but um, to go up and attack Ai. Do not weary all the people there, for the people of Ai are few. So about 3,000 men went up uh, from the people, but they fled before the men of Ai. And the, and the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them from the gate as far as Shabiram, or Shabarim and struck them down on the descent. Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became like water. So 36 people were killed. In Jericho, there weren't any people killed, you know. So um, so this was a, a huge defeat for the people of Israel. Then Joshua tore his clothes, verse 6, and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. And he and the elders of Israel and they put dust on their heads. So they're in this, um, they're going through this typical ritual of uh, mourning for, uh, this was typical for the Jews. So um, great anguish on the loss of this life. <clears throat> and Joshua said, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan to, at all to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, that we had been content and dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. Well, it wasn't that they were content. They were doing what God told them to do. This was the land that God had promised them. So it's not like they really had a choice about it or that, uh, that oh, are we going to go? No, let's don't go. No, it, it wasn't like that at all. Oh, Lord, what shall I say when Israel turns its back before its enemies for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. Then what will you do for your great name? So which that's an interesting, uh, I, I think, prayer and discussion that Joshua's having with God because he's saying uh, people are going to know that uh, we can be defeated and they're actually going to uh, cut off our name from the earth, destroy our descendants. But then, you know, what are they going to say about you? And what happened 
And what happens for faithful people, God's people, it does reflect on God. When a church fights, that reflects on God. When a church has uh, lots of funds coming in, that reflects well on God. When there are baptisms, that reflects well on God. When, when uh, a church reaches out and helps people, that reflects well on God. So it's not as if what we do is in isolation, okay? All right, still continuing now, verse 10. So the Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why do you lie thus on your face? Israel has sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff, their own things. I didn't know stuff was a Hebrew word, but apparently it is. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they have become doomed to destruction. Neither will I be with you any more unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Get up, sanctify the people, cleanse the people, and say, Sanctify or cleanse yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed things from among you. So, uh, they cast lots, and um, if you go to verse 20, when, it, when it's obvious that Achan is the one who had um, not, uh, he, he, had, he had not destroyed these beautiful things, and he kept them for himself, okay? So Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I've done. When I saw among the spoils, a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I covered them and took them and there they are hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So, you know, just huge amounts of, of gold and silver. So they ended up, uh, they stoned that man with stones they burned him with fire after they'd stoned him. They raised over him a great heap of stones, verse 26 tells us. Still there to this day is what the writer, is what Joshua tells us. So uh, they cleanse themselves and then they go up and Ai is captured and destroyed. We're told about that in chapter 8. So I want to conclude with a story here uh, from, from the book. And uh, I guess I like it because it um, it kind of reminds us that as things are happening, uh, we may think, is God a part of this or is God working? Is, is God watching after our affairs? And he is. And what we have to do is see God's hand in the things that are going on around us. So he tells the story about a few years ago when their daughter, who was in Columbia International University, said she wanted to transfer to, to the University of Tennessee. But she didn't want to live in the dorms, and so she uh, wondered if her parents could drive over to Knoxville to find her an apartment near the campus. And um, uh, Robert uh, Morgan and his wife, I think her name is in here, Katrina. Uh, they they live in the Nashville area, so they drove over to Knoxville. And um, even though they weren't really excited about her transfer, and they kind of wanted her to stay in um, let me, the Columbia International University, which I believe is South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina. Um, so they. Uh, uh, they, they drove to, to Knoxville and they drove around different uh, streets around the campus and their hearts sunk. There were scores of buildings that had rooms to rent signs, but they were kind of rough and, and run down. And they didn't want their daughter Hannah 
to stay in any of them. So they pulled to the curb and they bowed their heads in prayer. And he, uh, uh, Dr. Morgan talks about how he'd recently been studying the book of Genesis. So they prayed, Lord, when Abraham's servant was on a mission in Genesis 24, he requested an angel to guide him. Now, please send that same angel or one just like him to guide us to a safe, desirable apartment for our daughter. So they pulled back into the street. They turned down the corner, immediately saw a stately brick building. It was clean. It was well tended. And the plaque on the side listed it as a historical site. And um, the arch entrance entered into a grassy square with a bubbling fountain. And um, so, uh, so Robert says, that looks like an apartment building. I think I'll check. Don't waste your time. You, we can never afford it, uh, the wife Katrina says. So they checked anyway. And as they were walking through the courtyard, they came across an older woman with purse and keys in hands. And it turns out she was the manager. And she said that these apartments were primarily for graduate students and career professionals. We like it very quiet here. No parties. We turn undergrads away. Well, they continued talking. And so she finally admitted they had one small efficiency apartment available. And yes, she would rent it to us for Hannah if, and here's the condition, if I like her when I meet her. So, um, says, when she told me the price, I stifled a smile. It was less than those run-down apartments around the corner. And thankfully, the lady liked Hannah when they met her, and she was able to rent that apartment. And uh, Robert Morgan says, I'm certain the Lord sent an angel to guide us. And uh, I'm just going to continue reading here because I think what he says is really good. In the unfolding of his providence, burdens become blessings, tears lead to triumph, and the redemptive grace of God overcomes the undercurrents of life in the experiences of his children. For, uh, for them, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. No wonder Charles Spurgeon once quipped, we believe in the providence of God, but do but we do not believe half enough in it. Kind of, you know, some 1800s language there. Yeah, we believe in the providence of God kind of in a, in, as a doctrine, as a theory, but we don't believe in it enough when it comes to the actual circumstances of life. That's my translation. So trust God to deliver in his own unique way and in his own timing. I think that's very important. So I hope that uh, rule number eight can be a blessing to you in your daily walk. I pray that this week, as you're maybe making decisions about getting back out into society and uh, maybe uh, doing some more things as we come through this phase of this COVID-19 crisis that we're involved in, I pray that you will see that you can trust God to deliver in his own unique way. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, this lesson and thank you for the practicality of it, to know that if we trust in you, that you're going to guide, you're going to deliver, you're going to uh, bless us in ways that we could never imagine. Lord, thank you for all you do for us. Thank you that the principles that we find in the Bible and um, and these strategies for how to deal with challenges in life, that they're still good today, that you're the same God today as you were in the Bible and you will be in the future, and that uh, every day you're just waiting for opportunities to bless us. And Lord, help us to be receptive to all that you're doing for us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you and God bless.